Hi there, my name is Kirsty Dingwall. I'm a project manager with Headland Archaeology. Between around 2013 and 2018, I was involved in excavations um, as part of the AWPRBT road scheme um, uh, um, around Aberdeen. Um, and then as part, um, was involved in their publication. Uh, the project produced a multitude of discoveries um, a, a, along the whole of the scheme. Um, but in particular, there was found to be a focus of activity um, that spanned many thousands of years at Mill Timber on the River Dee, just to the, the west of Aberdeen. So um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about Mesolithic Mill Timber. Um, the, fo the talk focuses on the Mesolithic discoveries at the site, but um, it does touch on some um, other periods at Mill Timber, which are relevant to the site, and also um, some of the other sites along the scheme uh, where, where they are relevant to that. So just for anyone that isn't particularly familiar with the, the, the mouthful that is the AWPRBT scheme, um, it's the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route of Media to Tipperty, it's basically known as the Aberdeen Bypass. So the concept of a bypass um, around Aberdeen had long been discussed for decades, really, um, but in, in its current form, approval came in late 2009. Um, the route cuts across um, an area nearly 35 kilometres from north to south. Um, it runs um, at 10 kilometres inland from the coast. It cuts off from the E90 at Stonehaven to the south of Aberdeen and then runs across a sort of fairly wild, bleak moorland um, to the south of River Dee. Um, then skirts the western um, suburbs of the city, um, curves around to the east to rejoin the E90 um, along the sort of coastal plain to the north of the city of Aberdeen. Um, across, um, across the 58 kilometres of new road that were being built. Um, what was really exciting about the project was that it, it, it sort of intersected with and, and cut across a real variety of different landscapes. So there was suddenly an opportunity there to look at um, uh, different different types of archaeology, but in different environmental and topographical um, kind of situations, which um, which allowed us to kind of make comparisons between sites along the way and that kind of thing. Um, Headland had been involved in the project from 2012 onwards, initially doing some non-invasive work, so things like geophysics, um, uh, recording sort of post-medieval uh, features, um, like field banks, that kind of thing, doing some historic building recording, doing recording of things like consumption dikes, which are like these very... Um, Typical of Aberdeenshire, these massive big field walls made up of huge um, amounts of stone and huge stone um, that uh, generally date to the post medieval period. Um, we were then involved in some of the trial trenching works across the scheme. That from that followed mitigation excavation, and then we also um, provided monitoring services during the construction works. Um, all the archaeological works on site were finished in 2016 and then um, for the following few years we were um, occupied with doing post-excavation analysis of all the data that was recorded um, and an academic monograph was published in early 2019 and that was supplemented by a popular publication um, which can be accessed online and which I'll um, speak about a little bit later on. So um, as I said, uh, first sort of boots on the ground were in 2013 um, and as part of that first phase of invasive works we undertook a programme of trial trenching. Now that was across the whole of the route um, but it also included the fields on either side of the River Dee at Mill Timber. So just um, to touch on trial trenching and what that is, it's a method of fairly rapidly collecting data um, which can be used to then identify areas of higher archaeological potential. So it's a really typical kind of approach um, with things like road schemes or large construction works where um, we dig these strip trenches that you can see in the photo here um, that are usually something like 25 or 50 metres long. They're kind of laid out on a grid system across your area. Um, 
and um, from the, the, the remains that are found in those trenches, you can start to build up a picture of where there are hotspots and where um, there potentially might be no archaeology. And it's, it's, to some extent, it's not that dissimilar to uh, field walking, which um, is obviously something that there's been a, a large amount of in, um, along Deeside recently, where you are rapidly building up information on the, the potential of an area to then allow later works to kind of go ahead. So in retrospect, the results of the trial trenching um, at Mill Timber don't really reflect what we ended up revealing through excavation. So um, in this plan on the left-hand side, you can see all the grey lines are individual trial trenches. So we had you know, many tens of trial trenches across this area of Mill Timber. Um, however, um, we, from all that, that trenching, we only got a really a, a tiny handful of very undiagnostic, very poorly defined pit features. Um, so in this photo, sort of this kind of little charcoal smear would be a fairly typical kind of feature that we were getting. Um, it contained small amounts of charcoal, um, a very small handful of undiagnostic lithic. So nothing to specifically suggest that we had um, mesolithic activity going on. Um, despite those relatively uninspiring results, the methodology of the project um, was such that even if there were only low levels of archaeology identified through trial trenching, the, the, the plan was to strip comparatively large areas of topsoil um, to identify buried features, and then um, these areas were expanded and extended on as more archaeology became apparent. So by the completion of the site works, um, an area measuring almost a kilometre from north to south um, and several hundred metres wide um, just at this location had been stripped and investigated one way or another. Um, this aerial shot of um, the site is probably only halfway through our excavation um, process. Um, but what it, so it shows the scale of those works going on, but what it also does um, is do quite a good job of describing the underlying geological terraces and layers that were present and which um, influenced what archaeology was there, but also was impacted by the archaeology and by later processes. So the the River D at um, Va the River Dee Valley at this point is actually relatively wide. It's several hundred metres. So the river itself is to the south, so to the um, bottom of this photo. Um, but the, the, the flat valley floor is several hundred metres wide. Um, and then at either side of that valley floor, you have um, this sort of sloping ground, which really is, is very distinct and defines the valley. Um, and sort of forms a, a, physical, a visible limit to it. And then you've got this sort of higher ground once you get up beyond the valley edges. Um, in just, I'll just move on to this, which shows that sort of um, geological uh, description in plan. So um, you've got these pink um, sections along either side or the sloping um, valley sides. And they geologically are known as Lopton for formation. So um, that's a sort of um, formation of sands and gravels that define the, the valley edge. Um, the river now, as I said, is a very narrow, fast flowing um, route at the south of that, um, the valley. But then the valley floor is occupied by um, two different types of geological formation. So one we've got is the Camp Hill Terrace, which is these um, sort of more orangey um, little areas there, and then the rest is occupied by the Mary Cooter Terrace. Now the Camp Hill Terrace is what would have been the Mesolithic ground surface. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, sort of 10,000 years ago, this gravel terrace would have spread all the way across um, the valley floor. Now, at some later stage, probably five, six, seven thousand years ago, um, what's happened is that the terrace, um, which 
would have had a river um, running, the River Dee would have still run across it, but the river would have been very different from what we see it as now. It would have been this sort of very shallow braided stream system. Um, so um, not so fast flowing, definitely not as deep, potentially little dry-ish islands, um, but all, the river would have spread across a much wider area across this Camp Hill Terrace. Over time, those um, streams become... Um, sort of amalgamate into larger, faster flowing river, um, that's probably more similar to what we would think of as a river now. And that river starts to erode down that Camp Hill Terrace to this lower level. So um, what we have here is um, the Mary Cooter Terrace, which is this yellow one, um, is basically the result of thousands of years of erosion of that river. And um, But we do have little um, surviving parts of the Camp Hill Terrace here and here and the Lockton Formation, which would have been there during the Mesolithic period. Um, Mesolithic mill timber, so to, we'll move on to the sort of archaeological remains. It's represented by two strands of evidence. Um, so we've got a series of pits, very large pits, and then we've got a fairly substantial lithic scatter. So we'll start off with the lithic scatter. Um, right up at the, the north of the, the site, the, the Mill Timber Valley, um, when we were stripping topsoil, um, we revealed an area of deposit which was around 65 uh, by 25 metres in size. And you can just about see in this photo this sort of darker patch um, circled in white where when we stripped off the topsoil, instead of coming down onto the sort of orangey sands and gravels, which were the natural ge geology, there was a deposit um, spread out over that. Um, during the machining, it was apparent that it was rich in lithics. Um, we had quite a lot of lithics popping out as we were machining it down. And um, these lithics seemed to be of a size and um, type that meant that it was likely, certainly possible, that they were um, Mesolithic in date. Um, so the deposit was left in situ um, as a potential Mesolithic um, lithic scatter. Before we started excavation of the lithic scatter, there was quite a lot of debate about um, whether or not this material was likely to be in situ. So you can see in the photo here and from what I've described, this, this is kind of um, the, the flat terrace floor is kind of down here. This is just as the ground is starting to rise up and it rises up more steeply once you get into this bit. So effectively, this, this scatter is sitting um, at the base of a slope, at the bottom of a hill. So that's all, there was a potential that this was hill washed, that it wasn't material that was in situ, that you know, potentially there was a Mesolithic site somewhere up here underneath these houses um, and that, uh, and that it, it had washed downhill. The question of whether that lithic scatter was in situ or not um, is hugely important because depending on whether it is or isn't in situ, I mean, if it's not in situ, it's still, you know, the, the artefacts themselves are, are of extreme importance. However, there's not as much information that you can glean about um, how, how the material has been laid down, what processes are going on that kind of thing. Um, so a, an in-situ lithic scatter is, a, um, has a lot more potential to give really good information. Um, to work out whether or not it was in-situ, we did some geoarchaeological examination of the deposits, of the sequence of um, how these deposits had been laid down. We also did a little bit of test excavation and we established that we had refits. So um, fragments of flint that had um, originally been come off the same core and they were um refits were occurring across very small areas so from that we were able to say that although the lithics had moved about vertically they hadn't really moved that much horizontally it wasn't that they had been washed washed downhill and tumbled about and then just kind of deposited at the bottom of the hill it seemed more likely that at some stage in the past um there had been napping or lithics working in this area it had lain down on the ground surface at that point, and then over time, it, the, the lithics had gradually worked down through the soil horizons, through earthworms and other sort of bioturbation, um, and been incorporated into the um, sequence of deposits below. 
that meant that we could treat them in situ as in situ for the purposes of excavation. So that was really important. Um, and it's important to remember um, that you, we must always try our best to understand the contextual um, origin of material being looked at, as well as just um, looking at them as artefacts in their own right. So because we knew that they were um, in situ, that meant that we could undertake uh, um, a very detailed uh, methodology. So we did gridded excavation, um, where the, the whole of that sort of 65 metre long, 25 metre wide area was divided up into metre squares. Um, and alongside digging it in grids, we also did sieving both on and off site to make sure that we were recovering as many of the artefacts within the deposits as possible. So each of the grids was taken down in a five centimetre speed, spits. So you can kind of see um, this is some of the, the grid excavation going, going on. That's how things were divided up. Um, gradually, as we went through that uh, process, it was apparent that there was um, the, the deposit was made up of two different uh, materials. Um, and so rather than sticking to those five centimetre sp spits, we then started to excavate by uh, deposit. The deposits were dry sieved, um, and that was using this ingenious setup on the you can see on the right hand side. So we repurposed some um, kids swing frames um, with these uh, five um, millimeter meshes on them so that we could dry sieve all the material. And then a proportion of that was also um, wet sieved for the purposes of art artifact re retrieval through, and that was through a three mil mesh. So we were getting um, chips, um, bits of lithics down to a three mil size. One thing I would note, if anyone's planning on doing this in future, the dry sieving um, this material, if there was even the slightest amount of moisture in those deposits, it became really difficult to get it through this dry sieve. And actually, um, using a uh, wet sieving, wet hosing process was far more um, successful in recovering deposits um, and managing to get through this stuff quite quickly. Um, digging uh, by spit and in grids also revealed that there were features dug into and overlain by the spread. Um, and whenever we encountered those features, so that you need a little. Um, slot here, you've got postal here, um, they were excavated using normal sort of half section techniques and um, samples were taken of fills, um, that was all taken back to base for um, processing, environmental processing and also for further um, artefact retrieval. And that sequence of um, features dug into and um, underneath the spread matched this concept that the deposits potentially represented two different phases of activity or there were two different um, soil processes going um, on there. However, we already knew that material had moved around a lot vertically um, and that made it really difficult to rely on any datable material. Um, it being particularly secure to allow us to then um, date any individual um, activity. So it was quite difficult for radiocarbon dating in that sense. Um, so the lithics scatter, uh, which was an incredible assemblage. Um, the analysis of the lithics was undertaken by um, Torben Bjork Ballen and Julie Lockery. In total, we had around 11,500 um, lithic artifacts. Um, the, the vast majority of them came from that lithic scatter, although there were a handful found in some of the cut features across the site, usually in proximity to the scatter. Um, so that, that's thought to be the origin of most of it. Um, the assemblage uh, comprised around 94% debitage, 5% um, tools and 1% cores. Um, and up here we've got just a little selection of the types of there we go, of the types of um, material uh, that we were getting. So you can kind of see some of the selection of the, the um, cores and debitage and then some of the tools, um, the kind of thing that we we're getting. In general, the assemblage included a large proportion of material or a larger proportion of material which could be dated to the Mesolithic on stylistic grounds. Um, so it was made up of tools such as microliths, these kind of tiny little 
um, tools here um, and microbiomes, that kind of thing. Um, these very small lithic artifacts are intended to be used um, in combination rather than as individual um, cutting surfaces. Any single one of them isn't a cutting surface on its own. Um, they'd kind of be used in this sort of setup where you've got some sort of wooden or antler handle and they're set into the shaft of that to kind of provide a um, almost a serrated edge um, cutting tool. And that's very typical of the Mesolithic period. Um, it, again, as I said, the um, stratigraphically and um, from an environmental point of view, we didn't really have anything that allowed us to radial carbon date the deposit. There was no mat um, secure material within it that we could send off for radial carbon dating. But on the whole, the, um, the assemblage is more likely to be late me Mesolithic than early or more towards the late Mesolithic rather than the earlier Mesolithic. However, that it wasn't just Mesolithic that we got. So, I mean, Mesolithic flint scatter is a rare enough thing on its own. That's, you know, that's exciting. But um, the post excavation analysis, so once we got everything back in, um, into our offices and um, Torben and Julie were looking at it, um, they actually picked up something which you could argue is even more interesting. Um, they discovered that there was a small but notable assemblage of material, of flint material, that was much larger than typical Mesolithic flint, or the type of typical Mesolithic flint you would get in this area. Um, so on the basis of the original source material, and to some extent the colour, there started to be suggestions that we were talking about something much earlier. Um, so if you look at these um, on the left-hand side, we've got some of the typical Mesolithic material that we got, and um, that's a two centimetre scale um, for those images. This is the kind of material we're talking about. Um, so you can see it's almost twice the size, maybe even three times the size of some of these very small lithics. It's at the same scale. So we're talking about nearly 10 centimetres, that kind of thing. So it must have come from really quite large uh, flint pebbles. Um, Pebbles of this size are only in, in, in Scotland are only um, available from the Buchan Ridge gravel, so that's near Peterhead to the north of Aberdeen. Um, but this material that this stuff was made of from mill timber is of considerably better quality. Um, it, it contains far fewer faults and in, in, in impurities, and it's also a different colour. It's um, grey in colour, um, which is... It, it's not typical of the Buck and Ridge material. Their assessment or Durban's assessment was that the most likely source for this material is from Doggerland. Um, so Doggerland is a bit of ground that is now part of the North Sea, but at the time would have been dry land. Um, so when uh, Britain was still part of the continent of Europe in terms of, you know, it was physically um, linked to the, the continent of Europe. Um, and then stylistically looking at this material, the most likely uh, date for it is late Upper Paleolithic. So we are talking about something around about 13,000 BC onwards, somewhere between 13,000, probably 10,000 BC. So much earlier than the Mesolithic material that we're talking about. And you can see that you can see the very clear difference in the type of um, tools or type of um, material being produced. Um, this was something like the only fourth site in Scotland um, found to date from this period. And um, I think it's one of a number which are now being recognised where there is potentially late upper Paleolithic material within an assemblage which is assumed to be later. Um, this, this kind of stuff would be produced at a time when um, there was that very large, extensive land bridge um, with um, Europe and it's presumed that nomadic societies would be moving around over very large territories. It would not be impossible, but they were um, ranging from between Aberdeen down to Doggerland, over um, into sort of Danish type territories, that kind of thing, um, following things like reindeer. And it might be over the course of several years that they're moving around between these spaces. Um, 
the the presence of this material also um, raises a suggestion about why we have so much Mesolithic material at a later date. Um, that if there was a lot of this Paleolithic flint or Paleolithic period flint lying about on the surface um, at Mill Timber, this this flint is of really substantially better quality than the generally the Scottish locally available flint. So. Um, are Mesolithic people coming back to this location because there is very good quality flint sort of lying in the open air and they can kind of strip mine that um, to, to then produce their own um, tools of that time. Um, beyond just uh, cataloguing and categorising um, the material, a lot of the effort of the analysis on the lithic scatter uh, went into understanding and using that spatial data that had been gathered as a result of excavating things um, or excavating the, the scatter in this gridded uh, system to try and really understand what it was going on in more detail. And that was really useful because from that we managed to identify that there was potentially up to five different zones that each of those zones potentially represented a visit and how long a visit counts as is a little bit more difficult to um to um, categorise, um, and, and from that also we're, we're picking up the fact that there, we've got primary waste from the production of blades and microblades, and that they are doing these sort of running repairs on composite hunting equipment. Um, to delve into that a wee bit deeper, um, the, the, the data that was gathered meant that you can really start to pull apart. So this is one of the zones, I think it's zone four, and what we have here is a sort of heat map or showing on the left the number of burnt pieces uh, within, um, that's uh, over a sort of maybe five, six metre square space. Um, so on the left, you've got the burnt pieces and on the right, you've got the chips. And from this, Tarvin was able to propose that within that, in the, that zone that we've already identified, it contained potentially six, up to six individual hearths. And that's suggesting that there are hearths, even though we have no evidence of an in situ burning or, you know, a clear sort of here's where the campfire was. Um, the idea is that in particular with chips, um, they represent the area of a napping floor. So you've got kind of someone sitting down, uh, napping away, um, and um, there's, there's some material which as it gets knocked off will get tossed further out, but the chips are effectively falling pretty close to where someone is sitting. Um, the, and this methodology for analysis of the lithic material is particularly useful for understanding what we think is these sort of open air sites. Um, it's, it's a napping site. We don't think that there's any structures related to this. We don't, as I said, we don't have any evidence of a campfire. Um, so this allows us to kind of propose um, what it actually might have looked like at the time, um, even though we don't have any structures remaining. So to move away from mill timber briefly, um, that slightly compares with another site on the route um, at Standing Stones. Um, so at mill timber, we've got this sort of open air nature, we've got, it, it's temporary, um, there's no obvious shelter, that kind of thing. Um, Mill Timber is down here on the River D. Standing Stones uh, is much further to the north. It's about eight miles to the north. And it's in a very different kind of landscape. It's in this sort of higher ground um, on the rising hills um, in an area that now overlooks the um, Dice and Aberdeen Airport um, off to the sort of northwest of the city. Um, during the Mesolithic, it's presumed that this area would have been fairly well forested, potentially slightly more overgrown or difficult to access, but still accessible in comparison to the ground near the River D. And at this site, we had a small structure, so a really a, a defined structure that was excavated, and that also to prove to be of Mesolithic date. So um, this is the site looking out over, um, this is Dice, and you can just about see the sea in the horizon there, um, and this little hollow dark hollow back here is a little Mesolithic structure. Um, the structure is made up of an arc of eight pits or post holes um, and a hollow. 
Um, it represents a form of structure which is now reasonably well recognised in Scotland and in, in Northern Britain, um, but one of which there's only a um, a, a small handful of examples. Um, I would recommend that anyone that hasn't already uh, it would um, watch Caroline Wickham Jones talk about life in the Mesolithic as part of the Mesolithic D side on online lectures because um, it does a really great job of describing really vividly um, what we know about these and how how they sort of um, how to you can recreate in your mind of what life would have looked like. Um, the arc of features. Um, these this sort of blue ring of features, um, they do seem to be post holes, but they're they're really quite large. And at this time, there would not have been the type of wood available that um, would have had such a diameter that would require a post hole of that size. So what we think is actually going on is that it's post holes, but they're, they're being reused repeatedly and kind of getting eroded into these bigger shapes. Um, they had a large number of packing stones in them, so potentially as they're getting bigger, although you're still using small, uh, small diameter uprights, um, the packing stones become more and more important for sort of packing and providing security for those uprights. Um, the hollow, which just lay at the back of the um, the sort of curve, uh, contained a large number amount of charcoal and um, a large amount of lithics. Um, also, um, a, large degree of roasted ha hazelnut shell. Um, lithics from, there was a, a, another good assemblage of lithics from across the site as a whole, um, but 82% of the lithics, so the vast proportion of the lithics from the site came from these post holes. And so again, that feeds into this idea that there is some sort of napping floor and then um, established. And then at a later stage, these post holes come and are dug through. And so that you're continually getting incorporation of material from the lap, the napping floor going into the um into these post holes. Um dates from the pits and the hollow um give us an idea that this this site was sort of active and in use uh, between somewhere around about 7000 to 6700 BC. Um as I said the reuse would suggest it's been used over a number of seasons or reused repeatedly, but whether that's over several years or whether um, it's a shorter time span, we're not entirely sure. Um, at this site, we did, again, did a lot of lithics analysis. Um, and from that, we were able to identify quite a number of refits. So we had, um, you know, bits of, lith um, of flint that would match together from the same core, um, you know, found on this side of the hollow and then over here. Um, and that also seemed to suggest that um, the napping floor uh, in the, found in the hollow then had a toss zone. So when they were kind of getting rid of their debris, they're tossing it off to the west of um, that central point. We did U-square analysis on a selection of um, the lithic remains. Um, so that's looking at the um, wear patterns on um, on the the, the stone tools at a microscopic level and that established that there's different groups of lithics and they have different soft or hard characteristics um, depending on what they were used for so for example you have things like uh, cutting plant matter or skinning animals which are seen as soft um, or give soft characteristics and then you have things like um, cutting bone cutting wood and that will result in these kind of harder correct characteristics um, or harder use marks. Because we had a large degree of roasted hazelnut shell from the site, we also um, wanted to look into this idea. There's a kind of conception that um, roasting hazelnuts is an activity in the Mesolithic. That's something that's kind of you know repeated and we wanted to look at that in a little bit more detail. So we commissioned an ethnographic study to, to look at um, this as a concept. Um, Interestingly, what it concluded, the ethnographic, ethnographic study concluded that there may well be an over-reliance on the, the roasting of hazelnuts as an activity um, in, in the sort of literature, in, in our understanding of the Mesolithic. 
it, it doesn't seem to be something that is extensively done in societies where there is still, um, you know, um, use of um, these kind of resources. And it doesn't seem to extend the life of the nuts, which is one of the arguments that is regularly put across for why you would be doing hazelnut roasting. And so the argument was more strongly put that potentially um, they're likely just shelling nuts around the fire and then chucking the hazelnut shells onto the fire as a form of fuel, just, you know, as rubbish to get rid of. Um, the overall interpretation of this site is that it is some sort of temporary camp. Um, you know, we're maybe talking about overnight or just a, um, a few days kind of thing. However, that repeated use, and, and not just that there are multiple structures next to each other, the idea that it is this single location that's, and those the erosion of those post holes would suggest that um, it's a location that is known about and deliberately revisited um, by the same group or the same, you know, the same people. Um, and that's quite similar to Mill Timber in a different fashion where we do have um, evidence of these repeated visits and that's represented through the zoning. So we're seeing this repeated activity happening, but in through different forms of evidence, which is um, was quite interesting. So we'll now return to Mill Timber. There we go. Um, to look at another aspect of the evidence um, that was found there. So we didn't just have the lithic scatter. Um, at Mill Timber, there was also 30 pits that were really quite noticeable for their size. These are enormous, big, deep um, constructions. They are clustered um, round about the base of the slope forming the side of the Dee Valley. So um, that break of slope kind of forms the boundary between the two geological formations, the Lockton Formation forming this um, valley side, and then the Camp Hill Terrace, which is, as I said, the Mesolithic valley floor surface. Um, and that, remember, at that point, would have been occupied by this braided um, river system. Um, so the majority of them are at this part, sort of point of the break of slope, and that big grey splodge is the lithic scatter. So they're, they're kind of just upslope from the lithic scatter, uh, which is on slightly flatter ground. Um, broadly speaking, they are up to almost three metres in diameter and um, generally over two metres deep. They are really quite substantial pits in the ground. Some handful are a little bit smaller, but most are these really substantial kind of size. Um, what do they look like? Well, they're big, big holes in the ground. Um, so they followed a very typical deposition pattern where um, there was a series of basal deposits, which were sort of sands and gravels um, that seemed to have washed in or eroded in very relatively quickly after they'd been opened. And that's all originating from the, um, the natural uh, subsoil surrounding the features. Occasionally, there are sort of within those lower deposits, there are some um, more silty layers, but nothing very substantial. And there's very fra fragmentary windblown charcoal, nothing which we think is in situ charcoal. Um, some of the siltier material, particularly further up, might represent a sort of stabilisation of the infill and maybe even the formation of a soil. So you might have some sort of um, vegetation starting to grow, that kind of thing, in what is a partially infilled pit. Um, and then a large proportion of them, although not all, have upper deposits of silty material with frequent charcoal. And in some of the pits, um, that was contained within a recut, but more usually in the deposits were just overlying the, um, the upper parts of the pit. And um, again, a handful of them, a very small number, um, that later deposit can be dated to many thousands of years after the original um, uh, construction of the pit. There's some suggestion, I think in two of the pits, that um, there might have been a post present, but in general, the um, their purpose seems to be tied to them being dug and being open. That is the, the their, their function, is them being open. 
Um, we managed to get dates from eight, so around half of the pits, and um, these dates range between around about 8,200 and 4,500. However, the vast majority were concentrated in the sort of 8,200 to 7,000 ish um, kind of um, period. Um, Unfortunately, none of the dating is from basal deposits. As far as possible, we tried to date as far down as possible, but um, there just wasn't the material available. So where we were getting charcoal we were down, it tended to be very abraded, appeared to have been windblown, so not in situ, and usually wasn't big enough to be dated anyway. <clears throat> However, um, I think one of the earliest pits, so potentially the one, uh, one of these ones that is... Um, you know, 8,200-ish, um, that deposit is actually one of the upper deposits. So, you know, it, it's been dug at least as early as that, if not if not more. There were very few artefacts found within uh, the fills at all. Um, I mean, a handful of, lith of lithics, maybe from one or two of the pits, um, and the lithics were in keeping with the Mesolithic date, but it's very unlikely that they would they would be in situ. Um, given we know there's so much slumping into the base of these pits. Um, to move quickly away from mill timber, at another site on the scheme, we actually got three more of these pits. So at Black Dog, which is um, a few miles to the north of Aberdeen, um, right at the coastal fringes overlooking the North Sea, um, there were three of these large pits. Very, very similar, similar shape, similar size, and I see pretty much the same sequence of deposits of, um, you know, gravelly, sandy, lower uh, fills, and then slightly more, some evidence of stabilisation, and then slightly more silty and charcoal and upper, um, upper fills. They're from a not dissimilar topographic situation. They're on a slope, although there's no river nearby, um, and there's not a suggestion that, well, we didn't find the evidence that they were found in association or in proximity to any kind of lithic scatter. Um, and broadly speaking, um, these are of Mesolithic date as well. There's a little bit more of a complex dating sequence um, where a lot of material that could be dated is from further up, but we certainly have some um, firm Mesolithic dates for these features. So what are these pits? Um, at this point, again, I am going to refer you to one of the previous talks um, on the Mesolithic Deeside have uh, put up on YouTube um, and have a look at Shannon Fraser's uh, talk about the ceremonial pit alignment at Crathas. Crathas is a few miles upstream from Mill Timber um, and is also on the north bank of the Dee, so it's in a very similar position. Um, and there she presents um, the excavation of... I think it's seven out of 12 um, pits that at face value are almost identical to these um, to these pits that we have. Um, they are very large. They have a sequence of deposits that is broadly speaking similar. Um, and there uh, it has been interpreted as potentially this sort of ceremonial um, kind of site. Um, however, there are also key differences, um, and I think it's really important to focus on this um, because initially when we, we found these pits, obviously we were looking at the craft as examples and we were kind of trying to work out exactly what was going on. And the more that you actually pick apart, there are very specific differences that help us understand what is going on. Um, firstly, the average size. Um, the mill timber examples are consistently bigger. It's not just that there's some bigger examples, it's that on average we are talking about that sort of, um, you know, between two to three metres diameter and generally um, more in the sort of metre and a half to two metres in terms of depth and some of them are bigger than that. Um, so that would be absolutely much more typical and they are almost all universally of that size. They also have very steep sides um, in comparison to some more shallow examples um, at Crathers. Secondly, this, um, the, the examples we have at Mill Timber are not in an alignment. Um, when, you, when you see that talk, and if you look at the plans from Crathers, they are very clearly um, 
set out in a line on this sort of like gravel ridge within um, the well within the valley floor, some distance away from the river. What we have here is you can kind of use the um, all the orange plastic netting that we use to sort of fence off these very deep holes that we dug in this site. You can kind of see that they're not forming any kind of particular alignment. Um, and they can really just be described as a random, relatively random scatter um, with only really the topography being um, specific to their location. So the, the one thing that they do follow is this sort of break of slope. So you can see beyond them, this, this is starting to rise up. And in front of them, you've got this sort of flat ground. Um, and they, they lie just above that break of slope. Um, the, the other final um, significant difference is um, the presence of, at Crathas, there was generally these charcoal rich um, depositions right in the base of the pits. Um, so that seemed to be the prim pretty much the primary activity was placing this um, charcoal material in the base of them. In, in general, within our pits, the bottom third to half of each of the pits was almost completely sterile. There was you know, no environmental material, there was no artifactual material. Um, and for such a deliberate act at Crathas, it seems to suggest that this is, a, although they appear similar, there is a very different process going on for how they have ended up being filled up. Um, and I, it, yeah, so you come back to that idea that each of those distinguishing features is fundamental to the the, the Crathers examples and how how um, how they were used and how we've ended up at this ceremonial kind of um, interpretation. And then that is the lack of that is fundamental to our understanding at Mill Timber. So in up trying to work out what what they were, we we went through the same process of um, uh, as uh, Shannon Fraser did of um, trying to understand um, what the options might be and seeing how the evidence fitted with that. Um, we considered storage. We knew that they had been dug to be open, um, that they didn't seem to be to do with burying something or anything like that. Um, st storage didn't really seem to work because they do erode pretty quickly um, and they are the, the river level is quite would have been quite high, so they would have been a little bit damp in in the bottom, which doesn't seem to fit particularly well with storage. Um, we looked at whether they were fish traps, but there was nothing to suggest that um, that they would have been particularly functional. Um, and mostly, they seem to not be within the river system. There are a handful that might be within the river. Um, we looked at quarrying, but again, there is no material that we think is worth quarrying or that people would have been trying to quarry at this point in the river. Um, and so we kept on coming back to that sort of topographic and the specific location of them. This is, I like this photo because this is um, after yet another period of rain on the site, which we had, of which we had several. So the river, the current river is maybe five, six hundred metres off to what would be the left of this photo to the south. But this is an old paleo channel and um, it, a sort of extended period of rain meant that that filled up and that actually mirrors quite well where the original riverside would have been. Um, I mean, to within a few, you know, 10 metres or so, this is probably what we're talking about. And so what you have is a river system um, on this flat ground. You've got an area of flatter open presumably slightly open ground where we know that we've got a napping surface. And then as you get up into this slope, which would have been forested, you've got all these um, kind of very large pits. And so um, our best explan explanation with the evidence that we have just now is that they're hunting pits. There are comparative examples from the Mesolithic of these kind of things, um, for example, from Scandinavia. And, and there's no doubt that there are some problems with absolutely confirming and saying with absolute certainty that they're hunting pits, but they seem that seems to be the best evidence that we have, um, or the, the best interpretation with the evidence we have currently. To me, it seems extremely likely that they're somehow linked to those Krathis examples, 
Um, but the, at those two locations, the same feature is being used differently. And I think trying to tease that apart further um, it, it is a really exciting prospect for the future. If we find more of these features, you know, what? how can we test both of these interpretations and see what further differences and similarities um, there are? So just to sort of finish off, really, um, we're, what, what I've tried to present is what we kind of understand of the Mesolithic, particularly in mill timber, um, as a result of the Aberdeen um, bypass project. And there's no doubt that there's been a number of significant advancements as a result of it. What I quite like is when we look at mill timber and we look at standing stones, we've got um, a picture of two contrasting but complementary um, sites. We've got this riverside locale in, in, at mill timber, which was returned to again and again over the millennia, presumably because of the resources that were found there. And we've got hunting trails and, you know, in our reconstruction, we have someone digging one of these um, massive pits that we were suggesting would, might be placed across sort of gaps in the, the forestry that you would have, um, or the, the forest cover that you would have um, as it's leading down, you know, one of these sort of game trails leading down to the river that you can see in the distance. Um, we also, the resources they'd be taking advantage of is the fresh water supplied by the river, um, which would have been accessible. And then also this potential source of, um, easy source of large, very good quality flint as a result of um, the, the remains of the Paleolithic material that was left on site. Standing stones um, further to the north um, represents a bit more of a snapshot of um, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle at one very specific point in the past. And that's what we kind of try to represent in this image on the right. Um, you know, it's an overnight camping spot. It's likely sited because of some resource that we, can't, we don't have evidence of today. Um, you know, a patch of tubers or an especially ripe fruits or nuts um, at a specific time of year or a specific period. And I think it's important to remember that both sites um, represent different aspects of what would have been normal life at that time. And it, again, going back to Caroline Wickham Jones' Life in the Mesolithic um, lecture on YouTube, um, she talks about this idea of um, the, the sort of map that Mesolithic people would have had in their head of the different locations that they could move between depending on what resources, what activities they needed to do at that point. And I think that this really fits into that kind of narrative where um, we're looking at how, that we shouldn't look at any of these sites in isolation. You need to understand how, how they all sort of fit together. Um, from a methodology point of view, um, this project was... Uh, really interesting because of that discussion about the question of whether the lithic scatter was in situ or not and um, using gridded excavation and then really teasing apart that data that we collected, the, the spatial data in particular. Um, and I think it's key, to, that kind of approach is key to properly understanding this kind of period. Um, we need to be able to do that to tease out the details of what these sites look like the duration, their likely appearance, um, and also, as we've shown, it means that in some situations you might be able to identify um, best potential earlier stuff, the late Upper Paleolithic, but also uh, later period activity as well. Um, the large pits, to finally sort of um, close with them, um, the dis we have to assume that there's more of these out there um, waiting to be discovered. It Potentially, I think it's probably quite likely that there are some of these kind of features that have been lost in the past. They were incredibly difficult to see on site. It was only because we were doing this work as, as part of a much larger scheme of works and therefore that site was open, very, very large areas stripped and was left open for months really. And you start, and as the weather changed and it rained and then dried up and rained and dried up, and you started to see these round kind of blob features um, uh, weathering out of the ground, we started to see the distinction. You suddenly started to recognise them. Um, 
we we need more excavation of these kind of features in a variety of different environments, topographic situations, landscapes, because that will allow us to then test further these these sort of um, possible interpretations that we're putting forward. Um, in particular, I, I I really like the idea that we have functional examples and we have more ceremonial types. If you think about a postal as a feature, a postal can be used to construct a um, a house that people live in and you know do are doing their day to day kind of tasks. A postal also can be used to um, create some sort of ritual monument, and and so those types of features could be used in two very different ways, and you're not necessarily going to see the evidence of um of of whether it's one or the other. So I think we just need a lot more excavation of these kind of features. Um, they're they're really really interesting. Unfortunately, they're very difficult to dig. Um, finally, just as a on a personal note, I love that um, Aberdeenshire and, and particularly D side has kind of become a hotbed of activity at the moment. Um, I think um, organisations such as Megalithic D side are drawing on so many avenues of research, um, and that's all of that is fundamentally advancing our understanding of this very early period in Scotland's past. So that's all really exciting. And I look forward to hearing more about um, what further works are going to be happening. Um, just as a final uh, bit of promotion. So as I said, um, all of this was published in an academic monograph, um, which is called The Land Was Forever, 15,000 Years in Northeast Scotland. And that covers in detail um, everything I've talked about today, but also um, the many thousands of years of activity um, at Mill Timber beyond just the Mesolithic. We've got Neolithic, we've got Chalcolithic, we've got um, a Roman camp that had never before been uh, known about. Um, and then also ac across the whole of the scheme, there are um, you know nine sites in total. Um, so there's a lot of very exciting uh, discoveries within that. And that's available through Oxbow Publications. Um, but if you fancy something a little bit lighter and also lighter in your pocket, um, we also produced this uh, sort of synthesis of our discoveries called Highway Through History, which is available online through um, Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire Council and Transport Scotland's websites. Um, and there's a link in the, um, the video description below um, this where you can um, get access to that and, and sort of learn a little bit more about what we did. And there's also some stuff if you're kind of new to archaeology there's some stuff about how um the methods that we use to discover things so um thanks for letting me talk about mesolithic um, mill timber today um and i hope that you've enjoyed it